In this lesson, we're finally ready to jump into substantive discussion of contract formation, beginning with mutual assent and the offer, but more specifically, how a person goes about forming a valid offer. But as a quick refresher, before we jump into the offer, remember, to form a traditional enforceable contract, there's going to be three elements. We need mutual assent between the parties, consideration, and no defenses to formation that would invalidate the otherwise valid contract. But in this lesson, right, we want to start with our discussion of mutual assent. In case you're wondering, this is what the M in our big picture contract flow stands for. In our mnemonic, my cats do sneak, the M is for mutual assent. And what did we say mutual assent was? Remember, we said we need mutual assent between the parties. This is our first element for formation of a traditional enforceable contract. But what exactly is mutual assent? Remember, we said this is this idea that we need a meeting of the minds between the parties. This idea that there has to be a mutual understanding or a mutual agreement. And remember, we said to make this determination in our contract law analysis, we have to ask whether we have a valid offer and an acceptance of that offer. And if we have offer and acceptance, we say that we have mutual assent between the parties. So to begin our analysis of contract formation and mutual assent, we have to determine whether we have a valid offer, which begs the question, how does a person go about forming a valid offer? Well, we have three elements we're going to want to think about. To form a valid offer, the offeror must manifest an objective willingness to enter into the agreement, create a power of acceptance in the offeree, and specify all the necessary terms of the deal. So in this lesson, all we want to really do is break down these three elements, go over some examples, and try to figure out how a person forms a valid offer, which remember is always going to be step one in our analysis of mutual assent. Okay, But remember, let's start with element number one. To form a valid offer, the offeror must manifest an objective willingness to enter into the agreement. The key word here is going to be objective. The offer is governed by an objective test, which simply means that outward appearances of words and actions are determinative, not subjective hidden intentions. Again, outward appearances of words and actions are determinative, not subjective hidden intentions. For example, let's say that I look directly at you and I say, I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. Okay? Stop the analysis there. All that we know is I'm looking directly at you and saying, I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. Well, objectively, objectively, is that a willingness to enter into the agreement? Am I, the offeror, manifesting a willingness to enter into the agreement? Yes, right? There's nothing in my outward words or actions that are demonstrating anything other than willingness to enter into the agreement. But now, let's say, and I didn't tell you this, but let's say that the whole time, unbeknownst to you, I have my fingers crossed behind my back. And subjectively, I have a hidden intention that I'm playing this practical joke. My hidden intention is that I have no intent to actually sell you my marker. I would never sell you my marker. This is my favorite marker in the whole world. I have no subjective intent to actually sell you this for only $5, right? That's my subjective intent. But do we care about a offeror's subjective hidden intentions in our offer analysis? Absolutely not. All of that stuff is irrelevant, right? It's only what a reasonable person would interpret my outward actions and words to mean. If a reasonable person would interpret that the appearance of my outward actions and words appear to be a manifestation of willingness to enter into the agreement, it doesn't matter what I'm thinking in my head, right? So 
Again, the offer is governed by an objective test. And the way that this is commonly tested on contract law fact patterns is this idea of the practical joke. You see this all the time in contract law fact patterns where someone comes up to someone and as a joke, they say something like, I'll sell you my favorite marker for you know only a dollar. You know, And clearly they in their head think that they're joking. But if it's from an outward appearances, if their outward actions and words demonstrate that they look like they're seriously willing to enter into this agreement. We don't care if they're kidding in their own head, right? That doesn't matter. The question will always be, what would a reasonable person interpret their outward actions to mean? So watch out for this with the practical joke. Now, obviously, if it's clear from someone's outward words and actions that they're clearly kidding, then we know that's not a manifestation of willingness to enter into the agreement. If somebody comes up to you and says, ha ha, I'm just kidding, but but what if I offered to sell you this as a joke, right? Then you know, right? Those words and actions demonstrate that they're not actually manifesting willingness to enter into the agreement. So sometimes a person's outward actions also match their subjective hidden intentions. But we don't care about that aspect, right? All we're looking about, all we're looking at is their outward actions, okay, and words. But that's element number one. Watch out for the practical joke there, but otherwise this should be pretty straightforward. Basically, as you're reading the fact pattern, if they have any hidden intentions, you can almost just cross it out, right? If it's anything like what they were thinking in their head, what the offeror was thinking in their brain, you can basically just cross those types of facts out. They're there to trick you, okay? So that's element number one. The offer is governed by an objective test. Number two, right? To form a valid offer, the offeror must create a power of acceptance in the offeree. This is simply the idea. We talk about power of acceptance that when I make an offer, right? If I'm manifesting, if I'm manifesting an objective willingness to enter into the agreement, I say something like, I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. The question is, am I, the offeror, conferring a power of acceptance in you, the offeree? And the easy way to think about power of acceptance is if the offeree can simply say, I accept, and know that they have concluded the deal, then we say they have the power of acceptance. So if I say to you, I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5, can you simply say, I accept and know that you've concluded the deal? Yes, right? If I say, I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5, you can say, I accept. And we all know that the deal has been concluded. But what if I said something like, would you be willing to consider buying this marker for $5? Can you simply say, I accept and know that you've concluded the deal? Or what if I ask something like, uh, what do you think this dry erase marker is worth, right? Do you think this dry erase marker is worth $5, right? Can you simply say, I accept and know that you've concluded the deal? No, right? That's more of an invitation to deal. I'm just asking what you think about the dry erase marker, or I'm asking for your opinion on what you think the dry erase marker might or might not be worth. I'm not actually conferring a power of acceptance in you, the offeree. You can't simply say, I accept and know that you've concluded the deal. So that's what we wanna look out for when we're thinking about this idea of conferring. The offeror must create a power of acceptance in the offeree, right? We wanna look out for things that are actually invitations to deal and not actual offers, right? I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5, you can simply say, I accept. I ask you, do you think this dry erase marker is worth $5? You can't simply say, I accept and know that you've concluded the deal to that phrasing, right? So the other thing that we wanna think about with the creation of a power of acceptance in the offeree is that generally we say that the offer must be directed to a specific offeree. Right? Otherwise, we're not conferring a power of acceptance in any specific person. And you see this all the time if you've ever gone to a sporting event, right? Out in the parking lot outside the game, you always see people going around, they're holding tickets up in the air, pointing it at the masses and saying, you know, tickets for sale, tickets for sale, 80 bucks, tickets for sale. 
Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.